my pleasure now to introduce the plenary speaker for today. And one of the greatest advantages of longevity if, is that if one is lucky, one has an honor to introduce some of the greats in cardiology. And that's my privilege today. Dr. Nanette Wanger is a professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiology at Emory and a consultant to the Emory Heart and Vascular Sir Center and a founding consultant of Emory Health Women's Health Center. But Dr. Wenger has been a pioneer her entire life. She graduated summa cum laude from Hunter College and then was one of the first women to graduate from Harvard Medical School. She took her residency and fellowship at Mount Sinai and was the first female chief residency resident. She then proceeded to move to Atlanta where she began to work at Grady Hospital, which is a community hospital, the largest hospital in the city of Atlanta. She's won almost every prestigious award in cardiology at a time when honoring women was a rarity, including the prestigious Herrick Award from the American Heart Association. She's written 1,700 scientific manuscripts, review articles, and books chapters with an expertise predominantly in coronary heart disease. Importantly, she has for years been an advocate for the underserved, for the patients in Grady, that is a community, a, a public hospital owned by two of the large counties in Atlanta. She has been outspoken in the need to take care of those individuals who in the past we've underestimated the degree of disease that's involved. This includes women with heart disease, many of whom have been relatively ignored by the paradigms of cardiology practice. Her work and advocacy has been seminal to raising these issues to the medical community. As you will hear, the task is not done. She will speak today on cardiovascular disease in women, epidemiology, awareness, access, and delivery of equitable health care. After her lecture, I suspect many of you will understand the need for us to help her continue her efforts to improve the treatment of women with cardiovascular disease. Much of the substrate for these efforts is based on laboratory information, so we have an important role to play. At the end, there will be plenty of time for questions. Please put your questions into the <clears throat> app so that I can read them. There are mics. For those of you who don't do that, I've been asked, however, to make sure that people don't use the mics to decide they're going to give a lecture of their own. And I will take that responsibility seriously. With that, let's welcome to our stage our plenary speaker for today, Dr. Nanette Wenger. appreciation to the organizers for the invitation to speak to this prestigious group, but particularly to talk about one of my favorite topics, and that is cardiovascular disease in women. And what we will do is to address serially the epidemiology, the awareness, the access, and the delivery of equitable health care. For each of these areas, what I will do is to give you the state of the science and the evidence at present, and then to identify the knowledge gaps with the hope that some of you indeed will be involved in filling some of these knowledge gaps. These are my disclosures and none of them interfere with the presentation that I'm going to give. I think that it is important to realize that cardiovascular disease remains the leading cause of mortality 
both among women and men in the US and indeed worldwide. And what has happened over the years is that we've identified important biologic differences between women and men and their responses to social, environmental, and behavioral stresses. But the fact of the matter is the dearth of evidence because the underrepresentation of women in all aspects of biologic research has really delayed the translation of some of these discoveries to women. But if you take away only one message from my presentation, I want it to be this. We need a cultural shift in the way we present cardiovascular health data both to healthcare professionals and to women. Because what we've done is we've identified the characteristics in men as an implicit gold standard and the presentations of women were termed as atypical. Fact of the matter is they were typical for women. So we must change the culture. And I will show you that pervasive gaps in knowledge and care delivery for women require urgent attention if we are going to remedy the sex-based disparities and to achieve equity in health care. Now, let's look at the information that we have. And traditional cardiovascular risk factors are highly prevalent in US women as they are in men. But there are racial and ethnic differences that we've not appropriately addressed. For example, hypertension is highest in non-Hispanic black women, but the LDL is highest in the non-Hispanic white women. Diabetes highest in Hispanic women. And I must tell you that the data that we have, the Hispanic cohort is mostly merit Mexican-American. We don't have data sizably on non-Mexican-American cohorts. Overweight and obesity, highest in non-Hispanic black and Hispanic women. Fact of the matter is that the prevalence of traditional cardiovascular risk factors is similar among women and men in these United States. But the control of hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia, as you know from your laboratory data, is suboptimal in both sexes. But what we must recognize as clinicians and scientists is that smoking and elevation of systolic blood pressure are the first and second risk factors that are responsible for the years of life lost in our society. Sorry, my clicker is going the wrong way. Now it's behaving. Now, we certainly know the traditional cardiovascular risk factors, but we've not paid sufficient, sufficient attention to the sex-specific risk factors for women. And they are multiple. Early menarche, premature menopause, polycystic ovarian syndrome, hypothalamic amenorrhea, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, gestational diabetes, preterm delivery, either low or high birth weight fetuses, use of oral contraceptives and menopausal hormone therapy. These are specific to women. And what we have learned in recent years is that the decreased cardiovascular health in pregestational and pregnant women is responsible for the increased risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes. <coughs> and among the developed nations, we in the US have some of the highest maternal mortality. And the important feature is that this is not only relevant to the women, but complications of pregnancy are predictive of lesser cardiovascular health in their children. So this goes on to the next generation. Now, in addition to the sex-specific risk factors, there are sex-predominant risk factors. For example, 
women predominate in having systemic inflammation and autoimmune disorders. So the woman with lupus will not do, die from her lupus. She will die from the cardiovascular complications of that lupus. We also see that depression and anxiety are more frequent in women, particularly at younger age. And these have adverse cardiovascular implications. And then we see the complications of the chemotherapies for cancer, particularly breast cancer. And it is so sad for me in clinic to see the woman and say, congratulations, your breast cancer is cured, but you now have heart failure as a complication of that chemotherapy. And then because this is so prevalent, we must address population attributable risk factors. It's a metric that we have to refine in order to prioritize public health interventions because these must be population interventions. For example, among white women, obesity and hypertension pro really provide the highest risk for heart failure. In black women, there has been a temporal increase in diabetes associated with obesity as a risk factor for heart failure. And in black women, hypertension and diabetes really give the highest risk factor for heart failure. And we know that heart failure mortality is increasing. So if we are going to begin to address heart fa failure mortality, we have to address the risk factors that predispose to heart failure. Let me give you just a few examples so that you realize what the spectrum of clinical cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular mortality is for women. If we include hypertension, nearly half of all US women have some form of cardiovascular disease. So it is a highly prevalent problem. There's an increase prevalence of coronary disease and heart failure and stroke in non-Hispanic black women. Women tend to have more ischemia with non-obstructive coronary disease. That is to say, they don't have obstructive disease of the epicardial coronary arteries. They have microvascular disease or vasospasm, and they have more myocardial infarction with non-obstructive disease. So myocardial infarction occurs without obstruction of the epicardial coronary arteries. The stroke prevalence is actually comparable in women and men, but women have more mortality and more disability, and we'll come back to that in a moment. We always thought of peripheral arterial disease as a disease of men. Well, actually, more women than men have peripheral arterial disease. There is significant morbidity and mortality. And what we have seen in all of the studies is that there's less treatment with evidence-based therapies. Cardiovascular mortality decline is decelerating in the United States, both for women and for men in the past four decades. And as I've said, whereas cardiovascular mortality is declining, the component due to heart failure is increasing. So we are seeing more and more patients with heart failure in our laboratories, in our testing laboratories, in our clinics, and in our intensive care units. Now let's talk about the risk prediction and prevention. We have a number of quali quantitative risk assessment tools. We use them to decide about prevention. We use them to decide about the risk for non-cardiac surgical procedures. And what do they include? They include age, sex, race, total cholesterol, LDL, systolic blood pressure, antihypertensive therapy, a history of diabetes and smoking. And we use these for decision making. But my question to you is, are they applicable to diverse racial and ethnic groups? Most of these risk scores had as their predominant population of derivation Caucasian men. Note that the social determinants of health, 
and we've run, begun to realize their importance in recent years with the COVID epidemic, social determinants of health are not captured in any of these risk scores. Nor, as I've outlined for you, do they address the pregnancy-related risk factors and chronic inflammatory disease. Now, these are issues that are particularly germane to women. And in our clinical practice guidelines, these pregnancy-related factors, inflammatory, et cetera, are called risk enhancers. Well, if they're risk enhancers, it suggests that they matter less, whereas actually they may be more important than some of the traditional risk factors for women. And I want to emphasize that there is a need to integrate women's specific risk factors in some of these scores, and that has not been done to date. Now, prevention interventions are grounded in a healthy lifestyle. These are very inexpensive interventions, and the basis for these has been the American Heart Association's Life Simple 7 metrics, which is non-smoking, a BMI under 25, physical activity at goal, diet consistent with recommendations, and untreated total cholesterol under 200, and untreated blood pressure under 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury, and a fasting blood glucose under 100. Incidentally, and to any of the clinical chemists, I must tell you my displeasure with patients who have their cholesterol at goal and their LDL at goal or lower being told on their chart that this is low. It's not low, it's where it should be. And I'm hoping some of the clinical chemists will correct that. Cardiovascular health what we've seen is poorer in young women, defined as 20 to 44, and particularly during pregnancy. If we take the young women who are pregnant and non-pregnant, cardiovascular health, as defined by the above metrics, is worse in pregnant than in non-pregnant women, and is worse in young women than otherwise. Gestational hypertension that we've seen increases cardiovascular risk in women. And another variable that we've not discussed enough in our setting is that of rurality. That to me is a major risk factor. There are more disparities in maternal mortality in rural areas than in urban areas. And we will come back to that issue of rurality subsequently. Now, the prevention interventions have to reflect this intersectionality. And let me show you what I think are some of the problems. More women met physical activity goals in 2018, 20%, than 20 years earlier. But that means that only one in five women met the physical activity goals. I don't think that's truly an achievement. Nearly half of US women fail to meet their aerobic activity and muscle strengthening guidelines. And that's not recent data, but 2018, but I expect it still applies. And there were disparities in meeting the guidelines, even though the achievements were low. Uh, they were met in 54% of non-Hispanic white women, 40% of non-Hispanic black women, and the uh, Hispanic women did better than the non-Hispanic black women. But the other fascinating thing that we're beginning to realize is we saw an association of income with meeting physical activity guidelines. And of course, this is very consistent with the adherence by social determinants of health. You can't meet physical activity guidelines if it's not safe to walk outdoors if you don't have a safe space to walk. What are the knowledge gaps and what are the research needs? And some of you may be involved in addressing some of these research needs. What we have to do is to develop and deploy risk calculators that incorporate sex-specific and sex-predominant risk factors. We don't have those to date. We need cross-disciplinary research and social determinants of health so that we can design interventions to address these determinants. 
We have to define and implement cross-disciplinary interventions. And this means we have to go outside of our strictly medical sphere. We have to involve communities and health systems and business and urban developers and economic research. We have to adopt and implement risk interventions that embrace this intersectionality and cultural sensitivity. We have to do this across the lifetime. We've been told, let's look at risk factors at people in their late 30s and 40s. Well, I'm seeing patients with myocardial infarction in my intensive care unit are in this age group. We have to look at risk much earlier, and we have to look at it across the lifespan. Let's not neglect prevention in our older adults who are underserved in the prevention community. Now let me move on to the awareness of cardiovascular disease in women. And since 2004, 20 years ago, there have been educational and advocacy campaigns to increase the awareness of cardiovascular disease in women. It was uh, the Heart Truth campaign of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and the Go Red campaign of the American Heart Association. And what was seen is that when this was examined in 2009, there was an increased awareness from 30% to 56%. We thought this was great, but I didn't. That means that half of the women, even with these awareness campaigns, were unaware of their cardiovascular disease risk. And when we examined the data in 2018, there was a 74% decline in the awareness among women that cardiovascular disease was their leading cause of death. And there was the least awareness in the most vulnerable populations, the younger women and the Hispanic and non-Hispanic black women. 2019, just a few years ago, few women recognized common heart attack warning signs with the recognition least among younger women. But what that means is that they will not present to the emergency room in a timely fashion. We will not get them to our catheterization lab within the requisite 90 minutes. If they come too late, they will lose the benefits of all that we have learned that improve the salvage of myocardium. And it's not, frankly, just our patients. The education of health professionals is requisite if we're going to improve the awareness. We have to educate health professionals about risk factors in women, what is the course of cardiovascular disease in women. I think you will find these data surprising. 70% of our postgraduate medical trainees reported that they received no or minimal sex-based medical concept education. And in the community, 22% of primary care physicians and 42% of cardiologists, less than half of them, felt well prepared to assess cardiovascular risk in women. What we've not seen is what's needed in terms of collaboration between the OBGYN clinicians and the cardiologists to improve the care for women. Remember that for most of the ostensibly healthy women, the OBGYNs are their primary care physicians. They're in the preventive mode. They order mammograms, they order pap smears, but they don't address the cardiovascular risk factors, which are the major risk for mortality in the women they care for. And among the clinicians who are non-OBGYNs, the lack of awareness of pregnancy-related cardiovascular risk has a very serious impact. You know, in the electronic medical record, typically the OB records are separated from the general medical record. The general medical record typically has two questions, the number of pregnancies and the number of live births. Pregnancy complications are not addressed. And I tell my women patients to bring their OB records to their primary care physicians. And as I've said, since 2004, we think that the educational and advocacy uh, campaigns have given us improvement, 
but they haven't done as much as they should. And the awareness data shows that we've lost a decade of progress. But we have an opportunity that we've not yet taken, and that is to target younger audience through social media. Back in 2004, we really didn't have the social media capabilities that we have now. And we really have to look at a very different way to do public education. Now, the Heart Association's Research Goes Red Registry, I think, is going to be a very valuable resource for us because it's designed to achieve awareness, engagement. Something has happened to all the slides. They've just turned off. Will someone please return them on? Okay, I can turn around, I believe. Okay, if, so, if someone would get my monitors back on, I'll try to work from here. That the, 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 the registry is designed to achieve awareness, engagement, and, uh, and it, it essentially address the community with the real world partnership between women and the researchers. Now, what we have to do in terms of the awareness knowledge gaps is to identify and implement approaches to address this decline in awareness, both among women, that cardiovascular disease is their leading cause of death. But our education has to be cultural sensitive, specific for specific racial and ethnic groups. And we have to educate healthcare professionals about specific intrinsic and extrinsic risk factors so that they can recognize and treat their women patients who are at risk for cardiovascular disease. Now let's try address another major concern, and that is the access to and delivery of equitable health care. The access to affordable health coverage and out-of-pocket costs affect health care access and youth for women, much more so for women than for men. And I don't know whether you're aware that more than a fourth of women in this country spend $2,000 or more on medical costs annually. This is out-of-pocket costs, either because they are uninsured or because they are underinsured. And about a third reports skipping medical care due to cost. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, gave us the largest coverage gain for women aged 19 to 64 years. So much so that the percent of uninsured women was lower by 30% in, in 2018 than it was back in the 1980s. But it's still not optimal. Now what we've seen, and many of you have seen it in your home states, is the medical expansion of ACA and it has not been uniform among states. It had a beneficial effect on healthcare coverage and particularly use in low-income women of reproductive age. And I will tell you that in my home state of Georgia, which is not notable for being friendly to underserved populations, we have managed to increase the Medicaid coverage for pregnant women from six weeks after delivery to one year after delivery. And I think this will improve maternal outcomes substantially. Now, remember I said rurality was an issue. Women in rural America have an increase in cardiovascular risk compared with urban women. There's less access, there's less healthcare system delivery as responsible for this increase in risk. And what we've seen is a sad result. The gap between rural and urban areas in life expectancy is increasing. It was 0.4 years in the 1970s. It was two years in the early 2000s, and it's more than two years currently. And what we see is that there are rural differences, hospital and outpatient facility care, clinician supply, insurance coverage, public health infrastructure, all of these are very different in rural compared with urban 
areas. And we've all seen this. The COVID epidemic really showed us how challenged the rural healthcare systems are. Higher percentage of women than men delay medical prescription and dental care because of costs. And delaying care delays diagnosis, it delays preventive care. And foregoing care means that when we see the, these patients, they are sicker at presentation, and not surprisingly, they have more adverse outcomes. And despite the lower prevalence of myocardial infarction in women, Disparities persist in treatment, in care, and in mortality. Women still have greater mortality after all coronary interventions and after coronary bypass surgery. More background information. Myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary disease, as I've told you, is more frequent in women. Mortality is significantly higher in women than men, but especially among the young women. And with an acute coronary syndrome, women under age 80 have lower rates of daughter balloon time greater than 90 min minutes, at less than 90 minutes, and there's no treatment gap over age 65. Essentially, our emergency room colleagues seem to think that coronary disease is an old lady's disease, and they don't pay as much attention to women, younger women presenting with chest pain. Physician recommendations for cardiac cath with the same clinical history vary. This was a computer-based study where the clinical history was identical, but the picture either was a man or a woman, a black or a white, and the clinicians were asked what they would do. And women and black patients with the identical clinical history were less likely to be referred for cardiac catheterization. Not just coronary disease, what about heart failure? In the Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure Registry, there wasn't much difference between women and men, except this, that women were more likely to be treated in hospitals with a higher proportion of Medicare, Medicaid combined eligibility. And these are the hospitals that traditionally have poorer outcomes. With the same lower ejection fraction, women were less likely to receive a defibrillator. And as we look at advanced therapies for heart failure, there's greater mortality for women who receive mechanically assisted circulatory support even though those circulatory support devices have become smaller to accommodate the BMI of women. Same thing relates to stroke. At the Get With The Guidelines Stroke Registry, women were less likely to be transported to the hospital by EMS, less likely to receive imaging within 25 minutes, less likely to receive lytic therapy within two hours. Should we then be surprised that women were more likely to die within 30 days of their stroke hospitalization? What do we have to do to remedy this? How can we assist women to overcome medical cost barriers to delaying healthcare and prescription drugs? And we need the research that will define improvements in healthcare policy. This is a national emergency. How can we improve the knowledge gap in education and awareness of healthcare professionals of female specific and predominant risk factors? We saw some of these differences in the COVID pandemic. And what we have not yet explored among women is what is the effect of the increasing economic, social, and family demands on women during the pandemic and how will it translate to their health, heart health post pandemic? And then what we have to do is do better in terms of our care for women in the hospital so that their time in clinic and a hospital is more efficiently spent. Now I have a problem with nomenclature because remember I've told you that our database is weaker for women and specifically for women of racial and ethnic minorities. 
If we develop a standard nomenclature, we can harmonize the data across studies and increase the statistical power for the women in the studies, and particularly the women in underrepresented groups. If we have a uniform nomenclature, there's a greater likelihood that AI and machine learning can accelerate our understanding of the factors that regulate cardiovascular risk in women. We have to expand the use of social indicators of health in the electronic health records to understand how external factors, such as the environment, and social and structural determinants of health modify risk over a lifetime. I don't know how many of you are aware that the Joint Commission now requires the hospitals in their electronic health records to include social determinants of health if they're going to receive Joint Commission approval. And then I think we may perhaps have to change our approach. Traditionally, what we've done is look back to capture the data and the change. I expect we have to incorporate a look forward mechanism so that we can see the changes as they are occurring and change our approach if they're not working. My call to action for all of us, and I think there's several items, we need a culturally sensitive, sensitive with appropriate translation and awareness campaigns to identify cardiovascular disease as the major health threat for women and emphasize the benefits of prevention because 80 to 90% of cardiovascular disease is theoretically preventable and the benefits of lifetime cardiovascular health optimization. We need interdisciplinary collaboration among cardiologists and vascular neurologists and primary care and OBGYNs if we're going to improve the recognition of women's cardio risk lifelong. And we have to implement holistic risk reduction strategies. We need clinical education about the risk factors that are specific or predominant in women. But as I've said before, we need <coughs> the risk calculators with quantitative assessment of risk for life course in childhood, adolescent, OBGYN, primary care visits. We have to advocate for basic translational clinical population and implementation research on cardiovascular disease, stroke prevention and treatment, functioning on under-resourced populations. The fact is, there's a high reward opportunity for a lifelong improvement in cardiovascular health. But we have to ensure that animal studies include female animals and that in the basic science and omics related studies that their female and male single cell lines, stems and organoids. I don't know how many of you realize that prior to the Research for All Act in 2015, it was not required that researchers knew the tissue, the provenance of the tissues and cells and you could be doing research on disease in women on cells derived from male animals. Seems ridiculous, but the legislation only passed in 2015. We have to augment populations of diverse characteristics in clinical trials. And particularly for women, we're doing reasonably well with middle-aged women, but we're not studying the younger women who we realize are at risk and we are not paying attention to our elderly women. We also have to engage communities to optimize cardiovascular health. This is not solely a medical problem. We need school-based programs that involve patients and empower families. We have to meet underrepresented groups where they are in the community and partner with communities of faith. I don't know how many of you are aware of the barbershop study very impressive as a community intervention. And what was done is that barbershops that catered to African-American men had pharmacists who were there. And what we found was that in those barbershops that had the pharmacists, there was greater awareness of blood pressure risk, there was greater awareness of blood pressure measurement, greater adherence to 
blood pressure reducing therapies and improved outcomes. Why don't we see such interventions for women in the hairdressers, in the nail salons? That's where the women are. We need to meet them where they are. And then we have to engage departments and schools of public health and integrate public health with primary care. And as I've said, advocate for public policy and legislative interventions that focus on the social determinants of health, healthy food access, safe spaces for physical activity, clean indoor and outdoor air, and access to high quality care for prevention and treatment. And the last is we need surveillance systems for cardiovascular risk so we can see where we're going and provide feedback to the stakeholders. We've not done enough to leverage the innovative digital technologies to capture the metrics for prevention outcomes and care delivery. And as I've said, reducing the risks and burdens of cardiovascular disease in women involves raising awareness, optimizing prevention and clinical care, supporting research, engaging communities, advocacy, and monitoring our progress. And I thank you for your attention. Hopefully, I understood, I think, when we started, there's just a lot of work to be done. And there are lots of questions that might help clarify some of it. Many of them relate to the subsets. So for example, there are non-Hispanic Blacks and they're, and they're Hispanics, but there are also a variety of mixed races as we begin to have a, a society that is much more of a melting pot. How do you think about those sorts of issues so that not just the specific groups can have equity, but everyone can have equity? I expect there are two aspects to that. First is that all of these data involve the patient's self-identification, the way you check it off. But perhaps we need to expand these check boxes so that the patients can check more than one identification. And then I think the issues, one of the major issues I have is with this definition of Hispanic. We've defined this really by the language people speak. And I'm sure there's a huge difference between the Hispanics coming from Spain, the South Americans, the Central Americans, the Mexicans, uh, the Puerto Ricans that I saw during my training in New York. <coughs> I don't think this is a homogeneous population at all, either genetically or behaviorally, et cetera. And I think the social norms may indeed differ. So I'm not sure that that is a good designation. We are going to become more involved in personalized medicine. And this is probably where, as we get personalized medicine, we can identify. But in terms of community approaches, the best we can do is the self-identification of populations. But as we have done population studies, we've not represented the populations that we are seeing in this immigrant world. Several individuals wondered whether or not the differences that you're describing are biologic or socio uh, so societally related, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that. I think they're both, which is what makes this different. We know that certain risk features have biologic determinants, but so much of this involves social determinants of health that if we look at one and not at the other, 
we're missing half of the picture. And that's what makes this research very different. And our epidemiologic colleagues are now looking to see what is the modification? What are epigenetic variables? How are they determined? Uh, we are beginning to realize that there's certainly some heritable traits. The features that I've told you that the women who have complications of pregnancy, particularly preeclampsia, that their children have poor cardiovascular health. But at least we can act on what we know. And I tell the women who've had their complications of pregnancy to be sure that their children's pediatricians know this so that they will screen them earlier for cardiovascular variables, for lipids, for blood pressure, uh, for glucose, et cetera. So we can act on what we know, even though we don't understand how it eventuates. Several questions were posed about why women would have more microvascular disease rather than macrovascular disease and whether or not that relates since it doesn't relate to, to differences in the conventional risk factors to some of these additional risk factors that you posed that are specific for women? I wish I knew the answer to that question, but we've only now begun to identify problems in the microvasculature. Previously, the testing that was used to identify it was elaborate, it was invasive, it was expensive. And the women who had had their microvascular testing were not that likely to return for repeat testing to see if anything that we did to intervene would improve it. Now the imaging world has just advanced exponentially and we're beginning to identify non-invasively or semi-invasively microvascular disease. So we're on the threshold of exploring this. This way, if we can identify it non-invasively, we can say, does intervention A make a difference? Does intervention B make a difference? And this will also apply to men. This is because there are a number of men who have myocardial infarction with non-obstructive disease, fewer than women. There are a number of men who have microvascular disease, although fewer to women. So there is no way that research in women will not benefit, benefit men as well. There were several questions as well. And if you would take a minute to explain why individuals who have cancer might also tend to have more heart disease. Well, cancer and cardiovascular disease share so many risk factors that the, a lot of the, the basic life simple seven risk factors for heart disease are also risk factors for cancer. Uh, remember, this is the second leading cause of mortality in the US. And even though we are decreasing cancer mortality by advances in therapy, we are now seeing that the post-cancer cures are associated with, in the area that I know best, more cardiovascular disease, et cetera. And the challenge is, how do we balance the benefits and risks, and are there ways to do so? The, the, probably the prime example is the chemotherapy for breast cancer. And we've learned that the higher doses of the uh, anthracyclines are associated with more heart failure. But we see heart failure at the low doses as well. We're now beginning to do more imaging earlier. We're beginning to do more strain imaging and identify the problem before clinical heart failure appears. So much so that there have been a number of clinical trials, trying ACE inhibitor therapy, trying beta blocker therapy, and they've been unimpressive. They really have not made a difference. More recently, there have been one or two statin trials that have shown benefit. Mechanism, I am not sure, but certainly what we must do is to say, can we identify it earlier? Are there areas where we can intervene to see that these adverse outcomes do not predominate later on after cure? 
There were several questions having to do with are a lot of the delays in the treatment of women related to the initial diagnostic uh, issues or do they represent something more than just diagnostic issues alone? It's really all of the above. You know, when I was in medical school, I was taught that heart disease was a man's disease and that women didn't have anything except rheumatic disease. Now we're learning very differently. But what we're beginning to see is that women are underinsured compared to their male peers so that they access care later, probably with more advanced disease. They are less well educated about their risk for cardiovascular disease. So it's really all of the above. And also their providers are only now beginning to learn that women have very different pathophysiology, response to therapy, need and response to diagnostic tests, and therefore outcomes. Do you think the mechanisms in patients and women who are rural in rural populations are different? One questioner points out that rural areas are more apt to be outside, exercise to a greater extent, and maybe that should mitigate some of this, and yet, if anything, the opposite is the case. Well, again, I expect that our image of rurality is the 1900s, 1920s, 1930s rurality. Farms now have much more mechanized equipment. Uh, I don't think there is that much heavy labor, but I think uh, the diets are being corrupted. They are not the diets that are based on the farm. Uh, the physical activity is less, smoking cessation less prevalent because the social determinants of what is acceptable and non-smoking behaviors are more prominent in urban areas. And obesity is increasing equally, if not more, in rural areas than in urban areas. And the associates of obesity being hyperlipidemia, hypertension, diabetes. So we have to update our impression of rurality and it has not been as well studied. I'm sure it's not uniform among populations, but the one thing that is uniform is the lesser access to medical care in total. There were several questions about the Asian population, which you, you didn't mention as predominantly as some of the others. Well, again, the Asian population has not been well studied. Uh, if you look at the population studies, very few of them have included Asian patients, and I think because of that, we've disadvantaged them. And obviously, this is a group that we can't clump. I'm sure there are major differences among them by country of origin. I think there are major differences, whether they were foreign-born or native-born, in terms of all of the social determinants of health. So as we start examining Asian populations, I think we have to be much more specific about ethnicity. Several questions were posed about why is it so difficult to get women involved in clinical trials and, and what are the impediments that need to be considered and therefore overcome? I don't believe it's so difficult to get women involved in clinical trials because I have headed a number of clinical trials where we have had very impressive involvement of women and in the early hormone trials, uh, and many of these lasted five to seven years. They were not short-term trials. We had good representation of women. We had adherence of women. They stayed with us. And what I heard from these women is that we want, we don't think we're going to get benefit individually from being in the trial, but we want information for our daughters and granddaughters that currently we have for our sons and grandsons. We are not asking women to become involved in trials. That's the first feature. And if they realize the need, I think we will find that we recruit. 
but we have to make this much more trial friendly for women. We can't have repeated visits to major medical centers. That include, excludes rural populations, excludes individuals with transportation issues. We've learned from the COVID trials that we can do a great deal at a distance, that we don't have to have as many visits, that there is a way to do things now using the newer technology. So it will make participation easier for both men and for women. But I think it will remove many of the barriers that women have if we use the newer technology that we have acquired in the course of the COVID pandemic. What part of this is dependent on the cultural shifts that we're now seeing in society that, that are in some ways helpful and in some ways problematic? I expect that we all have a personal set of values of what is right and what is wrong and what is equal and what is unequal. And that ex I expect, and I don't want to get particularly political, although I can, uh, is the basis of our democracy. But what we have to ensure is if we believe that we are a democratic institution, that we provide equal access and equal care for everyone in these United States. This group is diagnostically focused. What can be done at the biochemical and evaluative level, whether it's genomics or a microbiologic or routine blood tests to facilitate some of the things that you've talked about? Well, I expect we must look at some of the testing that we do and see if there are sex and gender differences. And we've not done that adequately. In a number of areas it's been done and there are no differences and that's great. In a number of areas, we see differences. And some of our hospitals in the area where I'm involved use sex differences in the high sensitivity troponin, some do not. And we have to identify whether or not that is relevant. But the question is, is this relevant for other variables? And should it be relevant? Our whole issue of measurement of glomerular filtration rate, where everyone looks at a creatinine and nothing else. Come now, that's one of the basic determinants of drug dosing, of, of renal function, et cetera. Some of this means standardization of nomenclature. But I want all of you to go back to your institutions and see what you can do with the lipid reporting, which is something that has bothered me for decades. Okay, there, 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 are, there, there are a bunch of questions in regard to troponins, uh, which I happen to be happy about, but would you share your point of view? Again, uh, I use troponins day in and day out because I find that this, what, what I have taught my emergency room physicians, and I think at my hospital they've learned it well, is that for any acute symptom between the mandible and the umbilicus, man or woman, but particularly for women, consider an acute coronary syndrome, and that means an electrocardiogram within 10 minutes and a troponin as soon as you can. I think the electrocardiogram is helpful but ECG abnormalities may be delayed. The troponin, and particularly now the high sensitivity troponin in this population, I think is part of that triad of symptom presentation, electrocardiogram, and laboratory examination. And using the three of them together, we can do a really good job. There's a question about Native Americans and whether or not we should consider them a different group and begin to segregate them out the same way we need to do with some of these other groups. 
Absolutely, and they, this is a population that has an enormous prevalence of coronary disease, of diabetes, of hyperlipidemia, of smoking, of substance abuse, et cetera. Understudied, undertreated, and it is our shame. And the one final question in the question and answer is whether or not we need to develop testing and biomarkers for the social determinants of health that we could apply to whether it's men or women when they present so that we could have a more objective rather than a subjective uh, idea of what the stressors in the environment might be. If we can identify the items that we're looking for, then we can get a test. But what we've not done is to really explore appropriately and scientifically the social determinants of health. We do this from a sociologic perspective, but we've not done this from a manifestation perspective. I wish we had a test. I think we know the diseases that are associated with adverse social determinants of health but we don't even know the precursors to those diseases. But this is the kind of question that I think we are going to sit around in the evenings, glass of wine in hand, and discuss, and someone will come up with a really bright idea and explore it. But that's where the exploration should be. People talking, thinking, that this is a question that deserves an answer, and we don't even have the first baby steps in this regard. I've known you for some time, and I know that you have been in Atlanta in an underserved population since the 50s. I'm wondering if you would take the last few minutes to reflect on changes that you've seen, for better or for worse, and in particularly address one of the questions that came in, which is, we seem to be making progress and we lose it. We seem to be making progress and we lose it. And, and whether or not your view of the changes in our world are apropos and what it is we can all do about them, because each one of us has a role to play. I really can't comment much on rural populations because my practice area is in a safety net urban hospital. But remember that when I came from New York and Boston to Atlanta, this was my first encounter with segregation. I had never lived in a segregated society. And I learned the challenges that that provided. It took a long time to begin to overcome those challenges, and I don't think we've completely overcome them to date. I expect that for underserved population, that government insurance has done a major benefit for Medicare, for our elderly citizens, and for Medicaid, for those populations eligible for it. One of the things that I've seen and that I commend my hospital for is that they are increasing the ability of eligible patients to become enrolled in Medicaid. It's complicated. And we see populations with limited English skills, with limited knowledge of the healthcare system, who are eligible for insurance, not knowing how to access it. And we have a specific section in our hospital that our wonderful CEO put together. We increase, decreased our uninsured patients from 42% to 29% by being able to facilitate this. For, for our patients, and we're dealing with an underserved population, when they turn 64, we have someone from the department trying to show them what they need to do to access their Medicare the subsequent years. Because our 
base of support for the hospital is primarily government insurance. But I have spent a great deal of time at the State House, which is a long walk from my office in terms of trying to advocate for expansion of Medicaid. And as I've told you, we've managed to do it for a year for the pregnant women, but Georgia does not have a remarkable history of expansion of Medicaid. Remember, this is a federally mandated, but state regulated program. Maybe we need some more federal <coughs> input into these programs. Well, with that, thank you very much, Dr. Wenger. It's, it's been elucidating and I hope we all have a path forward now. Thank you. <laughs>